All right, so the idea of the second part is that, uh, so in the first part we shared a bit uh, our secrets and struggles uh, around investing in a very early stage of pre-seed deep tech companies and uh, assemble this panel so that you hear about investors who invest at also early stage but typically one step later, the seed or post-seed or whatever it's called these days. Um, and uh, I'm basically, uh, I'm going to use uh, your presence to try to get all the secrets, essentially. Um, so, um, without further ado, let's start with uh, some, uh, some introductions. Maybe, Matt, uh, you want to start uh, telling us about Breed Reply and uh, your experience with Deep Tech? Um, I'm Matthew Shova, I'm a partner of Breed Reply. Um, we focus on um, pre Series A, uh, average investments around uh, a million pounds. Uh, we have a number of investments, co-investments, uh, uh, as Ben said. We tend to invest after hacks, after the companies have been through hacks. Um, and we have, we're well, slightly different, um, we have a, uh, a program where we act as a growth catalyst. So we actually spend a year working with our companies at the stage that they are. They, are, they have a product. They're probably not commercial, uh, maybe working with commercial organizations, but we help them to get commercialized. Um, also, our idea of emerging tech, um, I mean, generally it is you know, profound um, engineering, innovation, um, that, that catalyzes change, something that is disruptive, but in a way, not only from a technology perspective, uh, from a technology perspective that can also be commercialized. So I think some of the, the points that you made earlier... We don't do science fiction? <laughs> we don't do science fiction. No, we, we, and we don't do iPad robots either. Um, it's getting those companies to the commercial stage is where we focus our investments. Excellent. So next is Olivier from uh, C4 Ventures. Yeah, so from C4, uh, we're uh, in London, Paris. Uh, we invest from Series A to much later stage. Uh, we tend to focus only on three sectors. We call them hardware, commerce, and media. Uh, I can give you four examples in hardware, hardware bias today. Uh, two that were in the slides from Benjamin, one that should have been, and one that will be, I hope. <laughs> uh, the two that were on the slides, uh, Form Labs were co-investors with uh, SOSB, uh, also Anki. Uh, we can talk more about why they failed. Uh, the one that should have been on the slide is Graphcore, uh, which is one of the European unicorn. Uh, I don't think it gets much, much more deep tech than that. And the one that uh, hopefully will be on this slide. Is it quantum? No, it's not quantum. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that, that's a good question for later. Yes, it is. Um, and the last one is a company called UpMem, which does processor in memory. Uh, not a deep tech. Excellent. So next is Kerry, managing part of IQ Capital. Hi there. Um, IQ Capital is a deep tech fund. Uh, we all started back in 96 to 2001, so we've seen quite a few cycles. Um, we, and in our first farm, we gave autonomy its first million, which were, and, and loads of other companies there that were great in deep tech. Uh, then our next farm, we sold to Apple, Google, Huawei, Becton Dickinson, Oracle had a double dragon in there. And then our next farm, we sat on some great companies a lot of you might know, like Thought Machine, Privatel, and someone's absolutely going through, through the roof. Deep Tech is our heart, and we'll be touching on that as you ask some questions later. And we've got a great team at IT Capital based up in Cambridge and mm -hmm. London. So you, you've been doing Deep Tech from before it was cool? No, yeah, <laughs> before it was cool. Before it had a name. Absolutely, and then when it becomes uncool, and then when it becomes cool. How, how did you call it at the time? Deep tech. Deep tech. <laughs> 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 We're ahead of the curve, but like two cycles. Yeah, ahead. absolutely. We'll touch on some of that later. Amazing. Uh, so, Chris from Next47. So, uh, Chris Barczyk, I lead the European investment team at Next47. Uh, Next47 is a 1 billion euro uh, global fund backed by single LP, Siemens. Uh, we do invest in deep tech significantly, but also in enterprise technologies and B2B, which are uh, uh, not, I wouldn't call them really deep tech. But, um, but certainly part of our portfolio. Um, Abbott Bots, which was shown earlier, is one of the companies that we are involved with in the B round. We invest anywhere between one and 50 million euros. So we can invest, uh, we can invest technically at the seed stage, but it's most commonly invest A rounds onwards. Uh, and we have a model where um, we have complete independent operation from Siemens when we make our investment decisions. So we have the agility of a standard financial VC. Then post-investment, we use our catalyst program to bring um, 
qualified leads onto your pipeline from large corporate customers, uh, not just Siemens, but also our corporate uh, customer network. Yeah. While we were discussing about this panel, you were quite uh, clear that you didn't want to be labeled as a CBC. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, that's kind of an interesting uh, point that um, probably you should touch upon later. But just briefly, um, what, what do you see as, a, as the difficulty for actually why not being a openly CVC and instead being a more independent operation? Well, I think that the fact we put the founders at the center of our decision making and we want to make sure that they have the confidence so that we are not going to distort their business plans in the direction of our corporate sponsor. Um, they need to know that we are going to sell to the highest bidder or exit an IPO. This is not a kind of greenhouse for M&A activities for the corporate parent. We expect a required fall, you know, very small number of companies that we invest in. So the advantage is bringing them access to the business units, but you're not tied to them if you want to do other business with other people. Certainly. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I think all of you were around. For, uh, maybe I'll, I'll first ask a quick question to, to the audience. <coughs> Who has done deep tech investments? Raise your hand. Just to show you what kind of environment we're, <laughs> we're in. So a lot of people, about half of you, uh, have seen that some have uh, like, uh, dozens of deals uh, for many years. So I also expect uh, um, that you will have some comments on, or, or ideas about, uh, with your experience. So we're not just, uh, just ourselves here. Um, OK, so to get started, uh, wh why do you focus on deep tech? Why do you care about that? Uh, maybe we'll start with Matthew. Sure. Um, deep tech is you know, the leading edge. It's, it's what pushes the boundaries of technology. Um, when you look at corporates, a lot of times, and you know, just, uh, continuing your point, corporates can be lethargic, they can be slow, um, and corporate fund, venture funds um, tend, to, you. <laughs> uh, tend to focus only on their own needs That's and not true. on the broader picture. Um, okay. So um, we do a lot of um, relationships with corporates as well. Um, it's important to get that technology out, um, to get not only the technology built and proven and validated in the market, but also in front of customers, mm. because customers are what is important. Validating the business models, val validating the pricing structures. The technology is the foundation for that, um, but it's only as good as if somebody wants to buy it. So why deal with complex technology rather than do like SaaS or other more simple things? Um, why add technical risk? Because that's where we feel the most upside is. That's where the most disruption is. Um, SaaS companies are, are fairly rapid to develop, and there's a huge market sector there. But there's also a, a, a barrier to entry in developing hardware and deep tech. Not that it's easy, uh, as you very well know. Um, but all of the deep tech business models, the machine learning, um, <clears throat> the predictive aspects, are built on top of the hardware as well. And that forms a barrier to entry from our view. Um, and enables those companies to um, to have bigger valuations, to penetrate the market more rapidly, um, and allow us to to maximize our return on investment. Okay, I couldn't quite identify if you were nodding or not nodding. So, what do you think about uh, about uh, as you said, like the uh, you're thinking fairly line? Yeah, I mean, I was I wouldn't disagree. No, I mean, I think that the um, it's I think it's underserved. I think there's not every investor is equipped to actually evaluate what's novel and what's important in these technologies. So you need some domain expertise. So you can't just be a kind of cohort analyst and always discover what's coming next. But do you need to be a like, roboticist to invest in a robotics company, for instance? I think that would be pretty hard for us to be generalists if, we, if it were true. So I think you can, you can call on experts at later stages in the investment process if that's uh, relevant to, to the business. OK. And so what, what yeah. the, one of the challenges to find this expertise. Mm -hmm. And on our side, we have operating partners who are internal to the organization who can help us. We have the founder of Soytech, for example, who helps us invest in semiconductor. And then either directly or via these people, we have access to other experts. But like you said, you can't have just one or two experts within the, the portfolio, uh, within the team. Otherwise, it's just too narrow. And so Kerry, how about, how about you? Because if you started investing in deep tech 20 years ago, maybe there was less availability of less networked people and experts available. Um, <coughs> how did you? start investing in this sector? Yeah, so it was very different. So why did we approach this? Um, we approached deep tech because we understood technology. And the reason why we absolutely smash hard cap when we go out to raise funds 
is because when our LPs speak to our CEOs, they're saying, what did this company do for you? And for us, it starts with that first meeting where we genuinely understand the technology underneath. And therefore, we're able to sort of get straight to the heart of what is the problem we're trying to address here? And are we the right fund for you? Can I, I'll come on to all that sort of stuff later. But for us, why do we like deep tech? Is you can make great returns. And I'm a venture capitalist, and my job is to make great returns. Double dragons for my investors is what we're known for. So that means one investment paying their fund back two times over. And Double that's what we're for. And also the, the disruptive power for you know what this technology can do. It can change the world. It can change how people operate. It can, it can change productivity. It can change so many things. And of course, we just love tech. So let's start with that as well. So maybe for, for the audience, uh, the deep tech investors among you, like, uh, do you have any comments or different approach to, uh, to what the panel was said? If some of you are the deep tech investors, like. Do you feel that you need the in-house technical expertise? Um, that you like? Uh, do you only deal with the things you really understand, or do you work with experts? Maybe one, or, one or two has a comment on this. I know that the first one is going to be really difficult to get out. So. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I'll share my thoughts on this. We have done deals where in. Uh, we brought together people and expertise in different parts of life to, to look at specialist problem areas and, and build propositions. And we've been partially successful with that in the past, and then it's, it's more hard work to do that, um, uh, especially in the early stage of the market. Uh, but, but that's another way of looking at it. You don't need to have in house technical expertise, but you can bring that uh, perspective from potential partners or potential co founders. Uh, 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 we, we, we state this openly now. You don't need to have a plan to come and talk to us. Uh, come and talk, pick up the phone, let's talk about ideas and, and, and see where it progresses. That's, uh, that's interesting because I think that uh, a lot of the, I mean, we hear from our startups and we have 215 hardware space and all of them are deep tech, either they're robotics or medical device companies. Um, when they meet with VCs, first they don't always get a meeting because the VC says, no, you know, I don't, we don't do that, it's too hard. Uh, or when they do, they're just looking for education, but then you know, not really, um, uh, not really active in that certain sector. Um, so that's, uh, I think, one of the, the challenges we we see in the market is that a lot of investors are very hesitant um, to even have a conversation. Uh, when in, in fact, uh, actually, including ourselves, six years ago, we were doing mostly consumer tech, and then about one, two years after we started uh, doing uh, hardware investments, we had our first robots the first medical devices, and we're not quite sure we could support them. Um, probably uh, we didn't support them as well as we should have, uh, but was still kind of the best we had. Um, there was still the access to a change ecosystem, but we didn't know much about uh, FDA uh, certification for medical, the reimbursement channels uh, for robotics. We had some technical knowledge, but we didn't necessarily know about uh, um, some of the challenges of uh, getting robots uh, in operation or selling to corporate customers. So we kind of learned, that, learned how to do that. In terms of investments, are you looking, um, when you're talking deep tech, is it mostly B2B, is it B2C, and uh, what do you see as a kind of a interesting sectors? Maybe Olivier, if you want to start. Yeah, well, we started in B2C, uh, but B2C is becoming really, really hard in the last kind of two, three years. Well, why is it hard? Uh, I think two reasons. Um, so we got successes, we were investors in Nest, for example, and I think Nest was kind of the peak uh, of the time, very recently it's maybe a bit high. Yes. Uh, but I think there are two things that happened. I think the wave of uh, consumer electronics uh, and IoT didn't really happen. You know, it, it remained only adopters here and there. But also, corporates have caught up. You know, if you look at a startup, it's always a race. Can the big group go innovate faster than the startup who go to distribution? Mm -hmm. and, and this day, going to distribution for a startup is not easy. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, corporates are actually pretty good at innovating. So consumer has become really, really hard for these two reasons, I think. So you, you won't yeah, see so, so we we'll stop doing consumer hardware, except one thing, which is what I call consumeris, consumer, consumerization of healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> consumerization <laughs> of healthcare. Thank you, went better than me. <coughs> um, and we did a full investment there, where basically you're moving from the realm of hospital into uh, consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, so like a home diagnostics, uh, yes, or, like yeah. or like a even digital <laughs> therapeutics. I, exactly, exactly, yeah. So that's yeah. the only exception which we're making there. Okay. Chris, uh, how about you? Like you yeah. have a kind of an industry LP, so we would we're, expect we're mostly to be based on, on B2B opportunities because mm -hmm. where we have the best networks and kind of accelerating capability. Mm -hmm. uh, we do some work, however, in consumer when it comes to things about mobility, future okay. transportation, and autonomy. So that's a certain. Does that mean peak boards? Does that mean something else? Possibly. Flying cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, no, flying cars. Yeah, obviously, there are, you know, yeah. there are electric engines behind those and drives, and so mm. we, have, we are kind of producers of equipment which go into the automotive industry and, and, mm. and ultimately in the plane industry as well. Interesting. Karen? For us, B2B, um, and it's early stage, so we'll be investing sometimes pre product, and we'll be getting that product, uh, making the product market fit right, making ICPs, doing that go to market strategy. But I think when we repeat that sort of B2B software end, you know what you're looking for in a team. You know what elements, I saw your slide earlier, that have the elements I'm looking in place. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what sort of trends you should be looking at, and you know what it just feels right and feels wrong, like you have that energy in that meeting when it happens and it starts to come through. Do they listen? Are they aware of where they sit in their ecosystem? And of course, we're really lucky being in Cambridge, so Cambridge has such a rich ecosystem. It's got so many companies, we're kicking out you know, a billion dollar company every single year. So with that, you're getting so many great experience angels that are working earlier with these founders and they're able to really shape and just put proper sensible plans together much earlier. So we're really lucky to be in that rich ecosystem and just be at that heart, it makes a big difference. And you invest pre-product. Yeah. How do you, how much confidence can you have that the team will be able to go from, pro, from, uh, from prototype to product? Because that's actually sometimes a hard transition. It's incredibly hard. So you do see a lot of these academics, and one of the hardest problems, or we'll touch on failures later, is can they actually create a business coming from that academic background? Mm -hmm. The profile of these founders compared to what we saw in the 90s is just completely different. <coughs> the 90s was all about those CEOs with big bowls, sort of like full of <laughs> on all the rest of it, and on their plans and stuff. You already you know? said big bowls. I mean, <laughs> 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 oh, I'm really sorry. Really <laughs> <laughs> Translation. <laughs> Excuse me, French. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and nowadays you have these Balls. really great introverts that are just able, and what they're able to do is just really assemble. We know that it's working when they're able to assemble and attract and maintain really great talent around them. Mm. And I think when you see that, and I think one of the key things I'll touch on later is product. Who owns product? And sometimes those founders, if they are able to detach themselves from owning the product and give it to someone who's been much more experienced at running and generating a product, mm. that is Otherwise, they might be like the founder might be chief science officer or some other. And there's little signs like that which you can detect when they won't be able to execute. And what, what do you think of, so you mentioned like a bold type of CEO, I got it right this time, <laughs> and, uh, and the, there's the other type, like the, the, the professor in the ivory tower uh, who has like great technology, uh, and maybe she can like actually execute and build a team around it. So how how about that? Like how do you when you see great technology with a great inven invention, um, do you, are you still interested, or do you try to help them like round up the team or? Very much, that and that's probably the area I sit in. So I'm not necessarily the one who's analyzing all these deep tech propositions. So I'm looking very much at that team. Can we wrap people around them at the right stage? Are they the kind of founders that will move on when the, when the company is ready to scale, or has started to scale, and you will not be right to go through a huge uh, scale operation in Asia or, or, or in the UK, uh, in the UK, in the US. Um, you know, we look at those propositions, but you can tell from that founder whether they can work with people, whether they're willing to have people around them. And, it, and you look at it when you're going through that diligence phase of how they <coughs> see themselves in the whole ecosystem and what type of people we try and blend in early stages, it, like from the commerce side or the business development side, but generally the product. Uh, and you can see how they interact with people at that stage. And, and sometimes you see that immediately and you think, well, I'm obviously never going to work with these guys. So it's kind of largely a personality, um, found a personality uh, question, right? Yeah. So I guess you, all the time, you kind of tune your people, people meter. Total. <laughs> no, but do you see similar, similar situations? Very, very similar, yes. And uh, I think, you know, complementing your point, management teams are, and have become more and almost the most critical aspect. Um, and we, we ask them the question when we invest, especially when you have someone who is very focused uh, on an area of expertise. They're generally not the right people to run the company all the time. And the best founders are those that realize that from the very beginning so that you don't have those, um, those arguments, those discussions. Um, but we, we, we open it up very, very early um, at our investment stage. Um, you know, we, we ask the question, are you the right person to run this? What is your view? What is your vision? Where do you see yourself? <coughs> If you don't do that early, 
it only complicates the problem um, at, a, at a later stage. So I, I remember having a discussion with a uh, with former CEO of Kabam and, uh, who said that there's, anytime you transit, there's kind of a rule of like three uh, and 10, like anytime you pass uh, um, a stage where you like uh, go from three to 10 people, 30, 100, 300, 1,000 people, you kind of need to change your management style. And it means that as a, as a CEO, as a founder, you might evolve uh, the skill set to do that other, to handle that other stage. And in some cases, either you don't have the ability or you don't have the desire. Uh, have you already seen situations like that? Is that something you observe in your portfolio? Uh, Kerry, you seem oh, to be so most, uh, okay. most so uh, responsive. Yeah, we're seeing yeah. that. Uh, and what is so different in the companies that we're all seeing today, and on every plan we pretty much see today, is the word culture. That did not exist in the late 90s. So it really didn't matter how you behaved, you just had to get there. Whereas now it's all about that culture of attracting. And I think as you come to more distributed workforces, because you've got data scientists that actually want to work in Buenos Aires and still work on these programs and these projects together, you have to sort of adjust to that sort of distributed workforce as well. Mm. Chris? I think, I think the, the best CEOs are the ones that, that actually do make that transition. Not everyone is, is cut out for that, but I think the ones that turn out to be the best investments are the ones where the CEOs at the beginning, you're not sure they're gonna make it all the way, you mm. hope they do, and the ones that really do are the ones that really rather turn. So actually, since we have in common Adibots, I remember Faisan in Shenzhen, very much out of his comfort zone, <laughs> with his co-founder, Pablo, there were two, two guys, uh, uh, about five years ago, and uh, now they have 100 people in Canada, probably one of the largest robotics companies in Canada yeah. at the moment. Yeah, no, I, let, I mean, I led the A-Round investment when I was, uh, Fidelity in, in uh, Neo 4J, mm -hmm. and the, um, the the inventor, you know, there was an inventor and a, a CEO team, and there were a lot of questions at investment time whether Engel would, would really scale. But he was the kind of the man for the job because he held the culture together and he was respected by the community. Mm -hmm. but he's really grown into becoming a business leader, and now I can't imagine the company without him at the front. That's great. And, 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 and yeah. Another example is uh, small investors in Netatmo. Uh, Fred Potter is a serial entrepreneur. So Netatmo is the smart home, smart home, home devices. Smart home device. with, uh, uh, they, have, they did this uh, with the weather station, uh, thermostat, cameras. Uh, so like the, kind of the, the European yeah. nests. Exactly.